Hey, this is former Blue Devil alignment Matt Skura. You're listening to Basketball Conference, the ACC football podcast. Go Duke, go ACC. Welcome back in Basketball Conference, the ACC football podcast season preview season. A lot of seasons there. Season preview season rolls along, Dan Rubin. We bring you in to talk about the Boston College Eagles because who else would we bring in to talk about the Eagles? Uh, BCEagles.com, Eagles Unlimited. Uh, Dan does great work over there. He's been a friend of the podcast for years and a friend of Joey and I for even longer than that. Dan, I don't know if you can believe this. This is our ninth season doing the show. I'm telling all of our regular guests that have been with us since the beginning. Can you believe it's been nine years? I, I guess you can because we all have kids now. So I guess that's the first indicator. <laughs> I was going to say nine years. We all need better hobbies. Uh, um, yeah. Still podcasting. Still pod. Yeah. We, well, I will say this. This is the first time I've ever talked to you in daylight. Like we're recording during the day, which is normally where we're going on until 1230 at night sharing kids stories. And right. yeah, that's not yeah. happening right now, which is rare. It is, it is rare, and it's a good thing you mentioned that because at the top of every podcast, I was told by producer Scott and Joey agreed with this to make sure I let everybody know the time in the day because we don't know when these are getting rolled out. We don't know the news is going to break between now and then. If there's a big injury, we just want to make sure we're on the record saying that this is being recorded on the morning of July 25th, okay? So if the Eagles go into fall camp and – Something crazy happens on the injury front to a significant player. I'm not even going to bring that into the atmosphere. I'm not going to bring that bad energy, Dan. But if something happens to somebody and it dramatically impacts the outlook for Boston College moving forward, I want it to be known that we recorded this in July before any of that happened. Okay? So we I, just so we get I, that I out of the way. I respect that. I would I would totally come back on and then re record anyway with you just so I can see your face. You would. I mean I mean that that is something just, you would do. Just for you. Thank you. I, I, I can't say that for every guest, but we can definitely say that for you, and I appreciate that. Uh, so, I mean, let's start big picture. We had you on, uh, obviously, earlier in the offseason for a couple different podcasts, one where Jeff Halfley left, and we discussed the candidates, and then a short time after that, when Bill O'Brien was hired as the head coach. I don't want to call it out of nowhere, because he's a Northeast guy, and he's, you know, he's co obviously coached the Patriots, and he's from the Northeast. Well chronicled. We know all of that. But it was interesting in that he was named OC at Ohio State, and he was back in the collegiate ranks after being with the Patriots as the offensive coordinator last year. Back in the collegiate ranks, coaching for Ryan Day. He was there for a cup of coffee. Literally didn't coach a single game. Didn't really even coach any practices. I mean, he was in and out quickly. Joey, Joey would like that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, here he is. Here he is. Chestnut Hill. And now he's the head coach. I mean, talk to me about the fan base and the reaction to the hire now that we're in July versus when it first happened uh, back in the winter. We're a Patriots podcast now, right? Like I know, me and yeah, you are here. Exactly. Joey's not. This is a Patriots podcast. Uh, this is it's awesome. I mean, so the I mean, you, it's hard to deny what happened when Jeff Halfley left. Like the so timing wise, it's never a good it's never good to lose your coach, especially when you're you're a program on the rise and he's done and he had done so many good things to put the pieces together on the future for BC coming out of the Fenway bowl in win the path that they had when they were getting closer to the ACC championship in the middle of last season. Like there was that stretch where you're like, Hey, BC could be a dark horse here. Uh, you know, it was, it was really cool. And, and he had been a part of that. Yeah. His good friends with, um, Oh man, I can't remember the head coach, the Green Bay Packers name right now. Like off the top of my head. Um, uh, LaFleur. LaFleur, that's right, Matt LaFleur. Um, so he, I mean, they were good friends. So the defensive coordinator job opens up with the Green Bay Packers. He reaches into his, you know, cabinet and and calls up Jeff Halfley, who who wanted to go coach football again, didn't want to deal with the NIL. Didn't I mean, he, he had that press conference with the Packers when he was introduced where he was like, you know, there were parts of the college game that he no longer wanted to be a part of. And, and that's totally fine. Like, I can understand wanting to get out and, and get ahead of it. So he leaves. Now, it happens in late January. Your signing day period is over. Your transfer portal period is over at the beginning of the month. You now have that mandatory period when everybody can leave. Like, the, you can't bring anyone in, but everybody can leave if they want. 
And so you're in this period where you don't have a head coach. Your head coach has left. Everybody's taking pot shots at Boston College. And, you know, you're, you're sitting back and you're like, well, what's going to happen? There's rumors of who's going to be the head coach. It's going to be Cliff Kingsbury. I think I came with you. I was like, you know what? The heck with it. Let's go with Belichick. Like, I'll take Belichick as my head coach. Like, I wanted that desperately. That would have been awesome. So instead, BC apparently listened to me and went with the next best thing. <laughs> Let's go with his offensive coordinator. Yeah. Um, yep. So, I mean, you hire a guy who was back in college. It, it, it lined up perfectly. Ryan Day, former offensive coordinator at BC, has always loved his time at BC. And uh, when Jeff Halfley, who was with Ohio State, came to Boston College, he said, like, this is a place, like, he was a big part of it, loved it. So he, Bill O'Brien, working with him, said, look, this is an opportunity for me to stay closer to home. Bill has some family things where he wanted to stay closer in the Northeast, you, you can understand, with, like, his kids and 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 being a little bit older, too, like, just trying, like, didn't want to, he was driving back and forth from Columbus to Boston at some point. Like, that's insanity. So he he emerges as this front runner. And until I think he like people are like, he's the head coach. It's going to happen today until they announced it. You are still like the ink's not on the contract. That's not like none of the rumors that were out there were true. But he comes in and totally fundamentally changes the identity of the program overnight. Nobody left like nobody. They didn't lose anybody to the transfer portal that wasn't already transferring out. And so nothing after Jeff Halfley left. Everybody's still around, and what you start to get is you know, Jeff Halfley had this had this great aura about him, this this rah rah aura, this rah rah, you know, we're family, we're going to do things with family, and all this. And now you're bringing in uh, Bill O'Brien, who is saying we're going to be tough, we're going to basically he's a te- you know he, he's saying we're going to punch everyone in the mouth, and and Jeff Halfley had said stuff like that, but Bill, you think he might like he's. He's an intense dude, and it is this full fundamental uh, switch that has just been – everybody has embraced it, this commitment to BC, this commit to BC. It's not – you know, it's it's a take on – you had for the team and, and for BC with – for Boston, with Boston College, with, with Jeff Halfley, and now you're commit to Bill O'Brien, commit to BC. Just it, – it's a little bit harder. It's a little bit more rugged, and it's a little bit more of that Northeast feel that has, has really – built on what was built last year like this is going to be very exciting and people are, are embracing it wholeheartedly well i think the the big thing you mentioned you know nobody was transferring out that wasn't already kind of gone i mean nobody entered the portal really after o'brien was hired which i do think is significant it speaks to what he's been able to sell after initially getting there i think the fact that he has coached a lot of really good players at the college level has helped, right? Has the experience with Saban, has put guys in the NFL, has won guys Heisman trophies, that sort of thing. Um, but then has also coached at the professional level and knows what it takes. I mean, I do understand how that would be appealing to a college player. What I'm interested about, and, and Joey mentioned this in his question, so I'm just going to kind of merge the two together. Thomas Castellanos, right? So he, as a quarterback, and, and he kind of burst onto the scene last year, and he's a guy who's a mobile quarterback. He can run, he can throw. He, he's in the mold of like the the current version of or like the new era quarterback, I guess, in college football. How is he going to fit with what Bill O'Brien wants to do schematically? Right. Because, I mean, we've seen O'Brien coach. We've seen O'Brien coach this kind of quarterback before. But I think the longer track record, obviously, both at the college and the pro level is, you know, more of like a pocket passer type. Uh, more of kind of what Phil Dracovic was. I know he purported as a as a running quarterback, but more of what Phil Dracovic was when he was at BC versus what Castellanos was a year ago, where he was a mobile guy scrambling, making things happen out of the pocket. That's not really Bill O'Brien's thing. Okay, my quarterback's going to be working off schedule a lot, which is what it seemed like Castellanos was doing and doing quite effectively last year. Um, I mean, he did win an AFC South divisional championship with Brock Osweiler, Tom Savage, and Brandon Whedon uh, as his quarterback. So I'll I'll, t- I'll take that. <laughs> um, right. uh, yes. I mean, but he did he did coach Deshaun Watson, and he did bring Deshaun Watson into the into the NFL fold and won eleven games with the Texans with Deshaun. And and when you realize what he was doing as a dual threat quarterback, uh, obviously that that offense was not. I mean, when you look down that offense, yes, it had DeAndre Hopkins and, and, you know, but they had a lot of rookies on the wide receiver core that year. They won 11 games and I think went to the divisional round back in like 2018, I think it was the Texans. Um, And I think Al Blue 
was his running back, like Deontay Foreman. Like there was not this great stable uh, of players outside of your quarterback. And he is a quarterback coach. So when you look at what BC can do and you look at what Castellanos can do, I think one of the things that even with Alabama and you look at what Bill O'Brien had to do to build offenses in certain places, he has the understanding because you have to adapt or die to look at Thomas Castellanos and say, I'm going to build the offense around you and I'm going to use what you have and we're going to do with it. But I'm going to build in growth aspects. Like last year's offense was held together, I think sometimes in scheme with chewing gum and scotch tape because you were basically adding things on the fly. He, right. he You went from a, a one a rotation in game one to him starting game two and you barely beat Holy Cross. And you, it, then you keep going through the floor, like really from the Florida State game on, they start building more and more and more and more in. And what you see is Castellanos become a real quarterback along the way, not just a one trick. I, I can run and make things on the fly. So ergo, you go back to what Bill O'Brien has done. You go back to what Thomas Castellanos did. And now you're trying to merge the two. And merging the two is something that I think is going to be a big asset for BC going forward. And plus, since they're not really talking about the details, we've gone into full like Patriots. We're not going to forgive the details. We can tell you it's going to be exciting. Like right. it's uh, we don't really know what it's going to look like, but we know that that you have guys who can who can listen to each other and build on the way. Well, it's the the element of newness to it, and he's going to just keep that quiet. That I understand that being his nature, just on the basis of where he came from at the professional level, and how he handled himself as a head coach with the Texans. Right, he was very much keeping the cards close to the best there. I. Uh, you, so we talked about the, the lack of transfers out, but what Boston College did was bring transfers in that I think could be impactful to skill positions. Treshawn Ward at running back, that's an intriguing ad for a BC program that has hung their hat on good running back play over the years. Like the best Boston College offenses have had really good running back play. Treshawn Ward, I think, is an intriguing ad. Florida State, Kansas State transfer. Like, he's hopped around a little bit, but definitely talented. And I think a guy who can uh, certainly come in and, and impact things offensively in year one here for O'Brien. Well, and, and the thing about running backs is that you don't have to have uh... – uh, you don't have to have the most complex scheme for them. You can take what they do and tell them run outside, run between the tackles, and get them up to speed relatively quickly. I think what Treshawn Ward's, uh, in particular, his uh, his whole player profile kind of fits what BC wanted to do with its running backs and was starting to move to last year with, with Kai Robichaux, who is back, who came from Western Kentucky, which is yep. a, a big running back, uh, and, and big is relative, I mean, Roba shows six foot, 215 pounds, and, and Trajan Ward is not 200 pounds. He's a couple inches shorter, a little bit lighter. But you're going to be able to take a guy who can run between the tackles, get outside, and add elements with Thomas Castellanos that opens up options, at least for the running game, too. Like you, you can put the two of them out there. You couldn't do that last year. You, you, you had to have Roba show out there to run between the tackles and then hope that someone else would, would get outside. Xavier Coleman was, I think, a name that. That was there uh, for for a period. I, I I thinking off the top of my head, I don't even remember if he if he was one of the players that was transferring out or not. Uh, but you you just because I I don't actually see him on the uh, as I'm even as I'm scrolling down the roster, which shows you that where we are in the preseason. But yep. uh, Treshawn Ward, Kai Roba show together. The offensive line is going to play a big part of it. You you have a very experienced, very big, very nasty offensive line that's going to be a. Uh, that's going to be a big asset and that's going to be, you know, kind of BC's bread and butter. You know what it is, you know, they're going to punch you in the mouth and you know that that's always going to be kind of the BC way. From a receiver standpoint, I think all the points you made about the running game are true. We know they're going to try to run the ball. We don't know necessarily what it's going to look like, but we know they're going to try to establish a run. That's just, it's in Bill O'Brien's nature. It's what Boston college's best teams have been good at. I like historically, this is what they're going to try to do. What we're all really interested in, though, is the passing game because, number one, the the question about Castellanos, which we just covered, but number two, at receiver, speaking of transfers, right, you bring in Jaden McGowan from Vanderbilt, you bring in Jaron Bradley from Texas Tech, there are options in the passing game now, Dan, that I'm not sure BC has really had. I mean, they, they had, like, Zay Flowers, and they've had like the one guy to to go and exploit a defense but 
it seems like BC has options in the receiving core now, like multiple options for the first time in a long time where it's like multiple guys are, are very good and proven at the college level and can go out and make impact plays versus like, okay, look, we know Zay Flowers is the head of the snake. If we shut him down, like is Boston College going to have a really rough day moving the football? On paper, it just doesn't seem like that's going to be the case with BC this year, at least with the talent they're bringing in and what they've already done at the college level. Yeah, no, these guys are these guys are good, and I mean, Jaron Bradley's six foot five. I mean, you could throw. Yeah. They they had a six foot five receiver in Joe Griffin, um, who who was able to do things, throw it up, and he'll go up and get it. I mean, a couple of right. years ago, he was a very good pass catching for touchdowns. Uh, you look at what even in a couple of years, what Bradley did at Texas Tech. Uh, I know his freshman year back in 22, uh, even pulling it up, 50, 50 catches. I mean, that's something that you're adding to a quarterback who can make plays on the fly. And you're, you're adding a guy in, uh, in, in Jaden McGowan who, you know, is, is a perfect complement, a five foot eight receiver. And so you have a big receiver, you have a, a smaller receiver, and you're filtering in guys in between that that have experience with – Thomas Castellanos. You have guys like Jaden Skeet, who had a breakout year last year, who was a uh, local product, 6'1". He he's, he's, can fly. I mean, he's just got speed on speed on speed. Uh, Lewis Bond turned into probably BC's biggest and best receiver last year. And, and he does things in space, not afraid to go over the middle. And so you have two guys who are back who already have that. And then you're adding guys that we're always going to be kind of win now guys. And I don't mean that meaning like, oh, you need Jeff Halfley was trying to win now to save his job or anything like that. But you looked at what the team had coming back and you looked at what they did last year and you went out and you found guys that were 50 catch guys at other schools and said, can we work with this and build around the scheme? And I think that is something that now Bill O'Brien gets to almost reap the benefits of, which is, you know, what what Halfley was able to do in the transfer portal and getting guys in. How much of a role is Geno Tomlin going to have? Because, you know, he, he was not necessarily featured last year, but he did, you know, he did have 24 catches. He's an elusive slot receiver. Like, he showed some flashes a year ago. Is this a matter of, you know, okay, these transfers are going to jump him? Is he going to be heavily in the rotation? Like, do you think there is a, a viable case where he's going to make a, a year two jump, so to speak? I'd love to see it. I mean, he he was he was good last year, and and he was good, which is if you look at the twenty four catches, how many of those happened? You know, he had that fifty two yard catch that, that I can actually see it happening, where like he broke space and broke containment and just got off on his own. And you know, he's a. I'm trying to think of a good comparison, but I know like Malcolm Mitchell on the Patriots was your was your number three receiver. He was not the featured receiver. But you could go downfield or get him in space, and if you found him, I mean, granted you're the best quarterback to ever live, to ever live throwing him the football. But if you could find him and tell him, "Hey, Malcolm, get open," he he'd be fine. Like he or get into get the ball to here, and I will get it to you. And I think that is a great comparison for what BC might be able to do with him. And then you saw him, and you're like, "Well, if he makes another jump it, it, beyond that, that's what he was last year. If he makes a jump." This guy's going to be insane. So that's uh that's I think the guy that you look at and you think like, hey, he he has that skill set. He has that number three guy that could easily jump up. Or if he doesn't take the jump and he's being pressured, you could also see him slip back. Which you know that's just a credit to the other guys over over what he's doing. That's Mike Tomlin's kid, by the way. Just want to yes. You know, if anybody was wondering, inquiring minds want to know. Yes, that is Mike Tomlin's kid. Uh, which you know just adds another twist to the uh the whole thing you have mike tomlin's kid now playing for bill o'brien at boston college you got the professional connections there you got old afc rivalries you got all sorts of good stuff going on there so just yeah something um, to keep in mind i'm pretty sure jonathan Kraft's son uh graduated last year but that would have been uh that would have been a that would have been a special wrinkle for me if uh uh, Jonathan Kraft's son, Bob Kraft's grandson, who is a tight end, who was a uh, reserve tight end. If he'd have been a, uh, if he'd have still been on the roster, that would have been, uh, that would have been great. Ozzy Trapillo's we, son, uh, Ozzy Trapillo's dad, uh, played in the played in the, uh, the NFL. Like we we got all the connections. Yeah, well, that's a lot of parallelism here. Uh, yes, defensively, defensively, a lot of guys back, right? And, and I guess the question here is, you return a bunch of production. 
right, on a defense that was okay last year, right? You bring a bunch of that back, but you're also losing your defensively minded head coach. You got a new scheme. What are the concerns here, right? Are there are there any? What what's the you know going into the year on that side of the football, which has usually been pretty good for BC? What's the view having the production you have coming back, but also understanding this is going to be a new thing schematically? BC always is one of those teams that always seems to be missing one of the three levels. Like I think about the the year that they went down and almost beat Clemson. They didn't. They, they I think it might have been seventeen. Uh, it was the year that that they had the breakout. It's either seventeen or I, I don't think it was eighteen, but I know it was early in the year. No, because eighteen they hosted them with game day. So it would have been 2017 on the road at Clemson. And they had a brilliant secondary, nasty defensive line, and they had no depth at linebacker because of injuries. That was the year that I think a running back got swung around on the fly and played linebacker and did a great job, but it was it was tough. And so you always seem like, okay, the linebackers are good, but they don't have any surge up front. They're not getting any sacks. I think that was last year's issue. Defensive backfield can break and stop anybody but can hold out, can hold on to receivers. But if you're not getting the surge up front, then what's the difference? And if you are getting the surge up front, do you have a secondary that can, you know, break up a pass? And so BC historically over the last decade, with the exception of that 2015 defense that had literally everything except a functioning offense that year, uh, they have always had one piece that's missing. And so I don't know what the piece is that might be missing this year, or where they might see or find that there was a piece that was missing, if there was a piece that was missing. But that's where you have to kind of step forward and say, what are we going to do schematically to fix it? And that was an issue last year where they didn't, They no matter what BC did, shift changes up front, the defensive line just never got to the quarterback. But they have skill. Neto Pollock, Donovan Ezeraku, uh, Gilbert Tongrogu, George Rooks, who came from Michigan. Uh, yeah. You know, guys, Ed, guys who are depth players, Quintavious Hutchins, uh, in the linebacker core, you get Bryce Steele back, Cam Arnold. Those are all guys that I'm looking at and I'm saying like, all right, how does that or those are the guys, you know, that were in during the spring and, and are, you know, you're waiting to see who's up for, uh, you know, truly see who's up for the, the depth chart or, or anything like that. But they have the skill. Quan Williams, there's the defensive lineman I, I really want to see. He's a 300-pound lineman. He, he's just a beast. How do they take that next step? And that's where yeah. the scheme has to come in and work with them. BC never really had a problem with the scheme last year. It was the execution. And so now you're like, all right, do we have to go back and see how each guy fits? The one thing I'll give a lot of credit to on, on this particular coaching staff is that they've done a really good job of bringing in coaches who are – experienced in doing things like that. Dan O'Brien is the linebackers coach. Tim Lewis, defensive coordinator, had been 35 years, seven as an NFL defensive coordinator. Former defensive coordinator, I think it was of uh, of the New York Giants in 04 to 06, right before a 2007 season, which we never have to speak about. Like, we just we just never have to talk about the 2007 New York Giants. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, but those are all guys who are who are coming in and they are good coaches. Jeff Com, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, the defensive Commissong. I'll just go with that. He's the defensive line coach, 30 years. He coached 15 years with New England, was a linebackers coach at Cornell, depth guy in college football who is a hungry coach who's been around forever. So these are the guys. He'd also been at BC during the, during the 07 year. So these are guys who are, tied to this program who are tied to its success and I think know how to build on, on what they're doing. I think that, and you know, you mentioned the the coaching and the, the pedigree there. I think that aside like that and, you know, along with what they're returning up front, this has a chance to be one of the more underrated pass rushes, I think, in the entire ACC. I mean, Ezraku and Horsley, pro prospects, Kalenji's a good player, George Rooks, you mentioned, like, I think if you get the consistency this year up front, this has a chance to be one of the better pass rushes, at least with the front four in the entire ACC. I think they're going to fly under the radar a little bit. Well, and if you look at some of the teams that, that Bill O'Brien has been a part of and and some of the teams where he has been, um, again, I'll go back to that 2018 
uh, Houston Texans team that that won the um, that won the AFC South. Yes, you can look at that team and easily say, you know, yeah, it's easy. It's easy to have a really good defense. You had Jadavion Clowney. You had Zach. Con- you, had, uh, you had Whitney Merciless. You had uh, JJ Watt. How do I forget about JJ Watt? Uh, you know. You- <laughs> You know, and you had Whitney guys. Merciless, uh, Whitney Merciless got a shout out before JJ Watt there. Huh? I know Tyrone Matthews playing in your defensive backfield. Uh, you had Mike Tyson on that team. Uh, different Mike Tyson. You had Jonathan Batamosi who played for the Patriots and won a Super Bowl. Like you had guys who were. You had a really good group of guys, but you still have to be able to do something with it. And it's easy to look at the guys, but. I love that team for being able to shut down opponents. I mean, you go into Jacksonville that year, which is not – and you win the game 20-7. to 7. You, you beat the Denver Broncos at mile high by, by allowing 17 points. Uh, I mean, those are – any time in the NFL you hold a team under 20 points, you have a scheme that you know works. And that was one thing about those teams that Bill O'Brien had. Even at Penn State, they weren't bad – teams i know like they weren't bad they weren't bad schemes they weren't bad players they, they might not have won every game but they were going to be in every game and that to me is probably the biggest key let's take a quick second to remind you about section 103.com it is the internet's premier place for all things wonderful georgia tech apparel they've got t-shirts they've got sweatshirts they've got hoodies they've got a short sleeve coach hoodie if you want to look like coach key They've got onesies for babies. They've got all things for any man, woman, children, something for the whole family, all the Georgia Tech fans in your life. They need something from section103.com. Use promo code GOACC for 10% off your first order. Uh, You can go get t-shirts supporting NIL efforts with guys like Haynes King and Zach Pyron. They've got shirts supporting the basketball team, the baseball team, the volleyball team, all sorts of wonderful tech traditions. All sorts of things. Again, any Georgia Tech fan in your life, they need something from section103.com. Uh, once again, use promo code GOACC for 10% off your first order. Uh, I particularly love the Feliz Bobby Dodd sweatshirts. Uh, we got Christmas season coming up before you know it. You're going to want one of those for your holiday party. Go get it all at section103.com. Huge shout out to Steven and the gang. Thank you so much to them for their support of the Basketball Conference podcast. We would love it if you guys would go show your support for section103.com as well. Uh, now back to the episode. I mean, this Boston College team historically just hangs around and makes life difficult for a lot of teams in the ACC. If they continue to do that, I mean, I don't see a a fall off necessarily. Um, I, the the experience defensively, b- based on what they return plus what they bring back, is what I think what it's it's what makes Boston College an intriguing team to watch this year in the ACC. I think they fly under the radar a little bit. I think a lot of the concerns, and and Dan, we're going to get into whether this is fair or not. I mean, I think a lot of the concerns are, okay, how did the players offensively, specifically, how does, you know, Castellanos adapt to what Bill O'Brien wants him to do, right? Is he going to let him be as creative outside of the pocket as he's been, right? Um, or or how is Bill O'Brien going to adapt to Castellanos as a quarterback and, and the way that he wants to coach him or the, the way the Castellanos needs to be coached as a, as a collegiate player. How does this offense look, right? I think that's a big, big question. What does it look like? We don't really have the answer to that. How does the offensive line play, right? It was a little up and down last year. How's the offensive line look? And then defensively, all this talent coming back, plus the guys you add in the defensive backfield via transfer, You know, how do these guys immerse themselves into the new scheme and how does that look? I mean, I feel like the questions surround more schematics than anything else. This feels like a talented team on paper. It feels like a team that does have some depth. What do you think the major concerns are for this team if you look at BC maybe not reaching their goals in 24? How well the if if the players do make the jump, I, I mean, we're all assuming a, a player like Thomas Castellanos, and, and I think he understands this. He was the first BC quarterback to ever throw for 2000 yards and run for 1000 in a season. There are only five other quarterbacks or five quarterbacks that have done that in ACC history in the last 30 years. And I look at a player like him and you ask yourself, OK, if he takes a logical jump, he's a 3000, 4000 yard passer. 1,500 yards rushing, you know, that puts him in elite company. 
I don't feel like if he makes that jump, you're going to be looking at him this year and saying, all right, now we know what he is, which is that he's a runner who occasionally makes a bad decision throwing an interception, which he did last year. The inter- Some of the interceptions that he threw, you looked at and you're like, where are you throwing that? Just because he thought he saw something and he had the freedom to do it. And like Jeff Halfley said, sometimes you got to take the bad with the good on a guy like him. Sometimes right. you got to let him, let him heave it and make plays knowing that one of those is probably going to be an interception. So, you know, that's, that's the question. If he doesn't make that jump, then we're right back where we were last year, which is, you know, the running game built around a running game built around making sure that you move the ball and move the sticks and you're more plotting. If the defense doesn't get that surge up front, you're right back where you were last year. That's the biggest problem facing this team. Do they turn into the next step and move forward? Or is this year one of Bill O'Brien's transition with the transition with this team and they have to start moving away from what they were into something that they're going to become? Yeah, I think I think that's totally fair. Um, I think that just basically aligns where I'm at. Um, does the passing game make the jump with the new receivers? Schematically, how does it look? And then defensively, with all that talent coming back, with the new scheme, you know, are you going to be able to immerse yourself there and and be in a position where you feel like you're going to be able to get into the fourth quarter of a game in November and feel pretty good about your chances? Um, I I look at this, Dan, and I'm just taking a, a quick look at the schedule, and it's interesting how it's it played out. There are a couple. It's it's not easy. Number one, I mean, you obviously, you know. You, you start the season against Florida State. If there's any benefit to it, it's that Florida State is coming back from playing in Ireland the week before. So maybe you feel a little bit better about that happening, right? But, you know, you have to travel to Florida State on Labor Day. Not an easy start to the year. I know Florida State is maybe not the undefeated uh, 13-0 and version that we saw a year ago, uh, but they are going to be pretty oh, 13-0 and till the bowl game. We all know what happened there. Uh, 13 and one version of Florida State that we saw a year ago, um, but but they do have you know DJU coming in. It's intriguing, right? And what they return, they do return a good amount defensively. I, I think they're going to be interesting to watch. But the the two bye weeks stand out to me in mid October and early November. Um, kind of having a couple of weeknight games sandwiched between buys is very interesting. Uh, what, what's your overall take on the schedule and and how it's laid out? Yeah, I mean, you get, you, you've heard me say this probably a zillion times is like, you can't predict anything that's going to happen in November until you get through October. You can't predict, like, we were sitting here talking about Emmett Moorhead last year as the quarterback and how he was going to push and is Thomas Castellanos going to push him? And then they did a quarterback rotation in game one and in game two, uh, Thomas Castellanos is now your starting quarterback. And when he went down, you know, Emmett Moorhead was such a great player for the BC team, but you saw the team start to drift away from the type of quarterback that he was. And when you had to go back to him, you didn't quite have the success rate that you wanted at when, when because you had to shift back into a different offense. So by the middle of the season, you look nothing what you thought you were going to be in, in September. And now uh, uh, Emmett Moorhead ch- elected to transfer, and he's and he's down at Old Dominion, which means that you're looking at now a completely different team to start the season than you thought you were going to be even at the start of last season. So. It's hard to predict and it's impossible to predict, and that's why I never I never predict anything. But what I will say is that just on paper, looking at these opponents, this is not an easy schedule. You have to open up with three power conference teams in the first four weeks, one of which is Missouri, who you, for lack of a better term, I'm not going to use the term embarrassed because that game was was incredible, overtime game against Missouri at home. But there were things that were said during that week about Missouri coming up to Boston with the, um, with, with the oh, we, I don't remember the last time Missouri recruited a kid from the great state of Massachusetts. And there were comments that were made by Eli Drinkwitz that just set it aflame up here. And that was, that was an awesome atmosphere. He played the foil. But now you have to go back to Missouri. And right. they know they lost that game. And Missouri's very good. So... They're not going to yep. be sitting there waiting for that game going, huh, here comes the Massachusetts team. They're going to be amped up for that. And yep. Mich- Michigan State, I mean, they're, they're a Big Ten team. Big Ten is good. And Western Kentucky is a good group of five program overall. In your conference, yes, you don't have to play Clemson, okay, with the new lineup. But 
you do have to go to SMU late in the season. And SMU was in Boston last year and lost the Fenway Bowl that it had in its hands in the first half. And then BC came out and won the game in the second half. They're a top 25 team. So yeah. you're not getting an easy schedule out of this. And what you do with it is going to be difficult. You have to go on the road at night to Blacksburg. Not an easy place to play at night. On a you Thursday. Have to go on a Thursday. The, the infamous Thursday night at Lane Stadium. Uh, that's not an easy. This is not easy. And so what you do to make it successful really has to start out of the gate and be ready to go with your scheme, with everything on it. Because this is not an easy schedule. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the swing games here, look, the, the non-con, you have the opener against Florida State, which kind of stands alone. It's a conference opener as your season opener, and it's going to be a tough game on the road to Tallahassee. But then you look at the other, you, you look at the four non-con games after that, and I, I really do feel like Michigan State is a swing game on the schedule, right? Because Michigan State's coming into the season with pretty low expectations, a year one head coach. I look at this and I'm like, that Missouri game on the road, Mizzou's good. I mean, you mentioned this, like Mizzou's got a good team, right? They're going to they're gonna be one of those teams. They won 10 games last year. They have everything returning. Uh, they're one of those, those sleeper teams in the SEC, not in terms of winning the conference, but in terms of can they make a college football playoff? And I think you can make the case based on their schedule and who they have coming back. That's a that's a tough game on the road too, right? So you got two really tough games in the first three weeks of the year. You got to beat obviously Duquesne September seventh, but Michigan State and Western Kentucky. I think those two games, number one, they're winnable. Number two, I think they become pretty important swing games when you look at the rest of the conference schedule because it's not an easy schedule. You mentioned you know you miss Clemson, but you go to Virginia Tech and you follow that up with hosting Louisville the following week, the following Friday, right? So you got. Two really tough games sandwiched between bye weeks. You close the season with Syracuse. At least you get them at home, right? Traveling to SMU is tough. Like, SMU is going to be pretty good, I think, and you got to go play them on the road. North Carolina, nobody knows what UNC is going to be. And Pitt is always just a rock fight when they play Boston College. So it's it's not an easy schedule by any stretch of the imagination. And I think the, the first six weeks of the season are really going to tell the tale, uh, especially going on the road to Virginia October 5th. Virginia is coming off a bye week. Virginia is not expected to be very good. That's a game Boston College should be favored in. But you do have to go on the road before a bye with UVA coming off of a bye. So... The schedule is really, really interesting how it's laid out. I, I think you got the tough, the two tough games in October. You have the very awkward two bye weeks, really sandwiching those two games, and then the closing stretch. While I think it's, you know, there is more of the winnable games on Boston College's schedule. I think we're going to have a pretty good grasp on what this team is and what it's going to be by the time you get to that first bye week after that October fifth game against UVA. Oh, without question. And the one thing I'll even say about the Duquesne game is you look at last year, right, with the FCS game, Holy Cross came into BC. Now, I understand there's a lot of history there. And Holy Cross was also the number five team in FCS. And they almost won that game. And you could say what you will about the penalties that BC took in that, which were insane. You could say what you will about there was their first game starting um, Thomas Castellanos. BC did not play well. There was a two-hour lightning delay, which – well, the funny thing was that game, if they if, if that game goes according to the way everyone thinks it is, the two-hour lightning delay, well, they're just canceling the last minute and a half of the game and saying this game's over. What's the difference? Instead, right. because it's a one-possession game and Holy Cross has the ball, we had to sit in that press box for two hours, explain to my wife that I was not coming home to help put the kids to bed, and which got me in some deep water. And then you had to play out the string with the last minute and hope that you were able to hold them off, which you did. It took about 25 seconds to cause a turnover, et cetera. Right. So, you know, that is – but that game, Holy Cross was amped up. You're playing them five days after you play at night at Florida State. The recovery period, the prep period – you for against a conference champion, I understand Northeast conference is not the Patriot league. It's not a strong FCS conference, but that is a conference champion who went to the FCS tournament. They're coming into your building five days after you play in Tallahassee in a week before you go to Missouri. That is not a game to take lightly. And you look at the rest of the schedule and it just lines up last year. Everything lined up that if BC was able to get, 
in gear, which they eventually did, they, they had a really good string in October. They, they just, everything lined up perfectly after the Louisville game. They just played well. This is lining up that it's going to, it's almost conspiring against you. And so you're going to have to be on your toes. These are good teams, some tough road trips. And, and, you know, Hey, that's why, that's why the game's not for everybody. Right. It could be worse. It could be flying from California every week. Uh, well, you you don't have – you miss Stanford and Cal. So yeah. you got that going, and you also are not Stanford or Cal, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I mean, they're, they're playing most of their games on the East Coast. That's brutal. I mean, it's – you know, we – I just it, can't wait for the 10 p.m. start out in the West Coast because I, I am so looking forward to that because at least my children don't wake up before 6 o'clock or anything. Uh, yeah, that's right, and you and I are in the same – the same boat yes. where yeah. when you say they don't uh that means they do yeah. and that means you and i don't sleep which is fantastic october, and if october 5th is going to be great for you well listen listen dan uh between you and i we have three kids joey's got three on his own so <laughs> Thought, thoughts and prayers to him that's the reason why he's on this podcast by the way um, he's currently he's currently trying to figure out what exact by the way congratulations joey i uh i hope that you uh based on what my sister-in-law has uh has told me about having three kids and as a resident third child your third child is always perfect we'll see how that plays out in real time uh, look at <laughs> I know you can't, I, I, by nature of your job, I know you can't give us a win-loss prediction, but I'm going to ask you this question before I give my win-loss prediction, because I can do that. It's my podcast. I can do that. But I'm going to ask you, do you feel reasonably good about a bowl game in year one, right? I, I'm I'm not giving you, okay, what's this, you know, do you think they're going to win this game? Do you think they're going to lose this game? Do you feel reasonable that Boston College is going to make a bowl game? It went seven and six last year. Like, what, do you, what are you thinking here? Look, if you go back 20 years, this is part of the this is part of the thing that that I always kind of prepare myself for this question because if you go back 20 years, the bad Boston College teams won seven games. The right. the quote unquote bad teams like 2000, 2002, those teams weren't your weren't the, the 2000 Boston College team is really the one that I come back to, which is they went seven and five, they went to a bowl game, they won the bowl game, but they were they were middle of the road in the Big East. They were three and four in the Big East. They beat the teams they were supposed to beat. They lost teams they were supposed to lose to, so to speak. And they usually jumped up and and I'll never forget they were seven and four in 01. They were eight and four, I think, in 02. And, yep. and that's when you started playing your one double A teams. So those are kind of the the that's kind of was the benchmark, was that right. you somehow managed to get to a bowl game. Right. In this era of NIL, of 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 transfer portal, of realignment, it, it's yep. it's going to be difficult. I do think the benchmark for a Boston College team has to be, and, and I say has to be because that's what you want to be. You want to be playing, you want to get those extra practices, you want to have the bowl game, you want to have the exposure, you want to have the experience. I think that has to be the expectation because that's what you always were. And so I'm not saying that's what you're going to be. I'm not saying that you're going to be in a bowl game or not, but I know that in this era, it's worse if you are not in a bowl game because you miss out on those practices and there are going to be 80 teams that get them. So there are more teams that get bowl practices than what you get. You don't get that spring practice. Right. So you want to expect BC to be in a bowl game every year. And truthfully in a 17 team league, you it, it's very reasonable to look at some of the teams that have come in and say, you know, there's going to be carnage all over the place. Can you just get the six wins? Right. Like, in your league, can you at least win four games in your league? I think the carnage that's going to be going on around you is is more than enough for every team to ask. And that's not just a BC thing. Like, Virginia Tech, you can ask to get to that level. Stanford, you can even ask to get to that level. You were 3-9 and nine in the Pac-12. There's yep. going to be winnable games along the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I And... You know, for the record, I, I do think Boston College is going to go to a bowl game. Do I think it's going to be easy? No, I don't. Just the way the schedule is laid out, as we've kind of described. I, I think it's really important in this first six-game stretch for Boston College to win at least three of them. Which, I, I mean, looking at this, Florida State on the road is tough. Going to Mizzou is tough. But can you take three out of four against Duquesne, Michigan State, Western Kentucky, and UVA? I hope you can win at least three of those. I mean, you got to beat Duquesne. Western Kentucky and Virginia, you're going to be a pretty sizable favorite in both of those games. I think Michigan State's going to be bad, but like you mentioned earlier, they're a Big Ten team, so it's not like they're short on 
on players, right? I think it's going to be a rock'em, sock'em game. At least you do get that game at home. Uh, if you go 3-3 three and three in this opening six-game stretch, you basically have to just find a way to find three wins on the road at Virginia Tech, home against Louisville, red bandana game, by the way, home against Syracuse at SMU, home against UNC and Pittsburgh. I think Boston College finds a way to win that red bandana game against Louisville. And I think if they do that, I, I don't feel great about BC's chances on the road in Blacksburg just because of what Virginia Tech's bringing back and the continuity there. But I do think that Boston College has a great chance of the red bandana game the following week because Tyler Shuck, Louisville's quarterback, does not have a track record of being healthy past like the first quick, week of October. Quick correction, that's homecoming. The red bandana game is Michigan State. Okay, well, th there you go. Then I'll switch. I'll, I'll change my mind. Yeah. I'll change my mind then. I feel really good about Boston College in the Michigan State game, and then maybe not so good. But but then at that point you're four and two. At that point you're you're right. you're four and two through the first six, and then you got to win two of the final six games here against Virginia Tech and Louisville. You can drop both if you want to, and then you have Syracuse, SMU, Carolina, and Pittsburgh. I think they find a way to get to six wins, Dan. I'm gonna say BC is six and six goes to a bowl game. I think that's probably. I don't want to say the floor. I think the floor is probably five wins. I think that would be like if all goes wrong, maybe you know some schematic stuff goes on. Maybe the offense doesn't click as quickly as you need. But I think the schedule is laid out where there are enough quote unquote easy games at the beginning of the schedule and on the back end of the schedule for BC to go bowling year one under O'Brien. So I think that's that's pretty reasonable. I think they make it to a bowl game. And and I will say this: one thing that Bill O'Brien did say is you know we. We, because someone asked him at the introductory press conference, it was utterly, it was kind of hilarious because you asked the the, the guy who is a, who is, who is, who, who knows how to shut down these questions, do you think you can win a national championship? And he just laughed and he goes, I think this is my first rodeo. Yeah, <laughs> I've been yeah. around the block. He was yeah. like, you know, we, we're not going to measure it in that way, which, which I almost stood up and hugged him because I've been saying that, like, if you lose every game by three. And you're and you're hanging tough with with a top five team, and you lose by three, and you lose to Mi Missouri, and you've, Michigan State winds up being a nine win team after winning four last year, and Louisville's back in the ACC championship game, and SMU is a top twenty five team, and North Carolina is a top twenty five team, and you lose all those games by three, you're a pretty good team. You just lost games. Yep. Yep. That's I mean that the difference is then finding a way to win those games, and you know, but hey, it's. You can if your if your Pythagorean win loss looks a lot better than your real win loss. Is it really a failure of a season? That's uh, and I would say that for everybody. Well, it's year one too, so I think yeah. you're kind of graded on a curve a little bit. If they lose a few close games in year one, while he's still, you know, he being O'Brien is still you know integrating a scheme, all that stuff. Like, I think I'd probably be okay. I, I like what BC just brings back defensively up front. I do like Castellanos's return, and I I like the transfer receivers at skill position players they have, and I I love Trayshawn Ward at running back. I think as he has a chance to be really good. It's really gonna come and down to the coach, offensive line. And your coach, and your coach shook Sinatra's O'Brien. hand. Yeah. And your coach shook Sinatra's coach, hand. He should be able to figure yes. it out. Yes. Your coach shook Sinatra's hand. Yep. So. There we are. There's our Boston College preview. Dan and I both feel reasonably good about Boston College making a bowl game. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments on YouTube, youtube.com slash at, uh, at the ACC football podcast. Got to make sure I get that right. Uh, rate and subscribe and review and support our sponsors, Homefield Section 103. I'm sure you've heard the ad reads that have been dropped in uh, in the middle of this recording. If you're listening on audio, you've definitely heard them by now. Uh, Dan, shout out to you. Thanks for joining. Thanks for coming on and helping me preview BC. We'll have you back on during the season, of course. Joey will be back, and, and we'll get the band back together sometime in the evening, not in the middle of the day. Yeah, to, to 11.30 to 2 a.m. is definitely our time to talk. That, that's, yeah, I mean, if... Yeah, if for an hour any, podcast. <laughs> if, there's anything, if there's anything we've done consistently over the last nine years of doing this podcast, it's recording at that time of day, so... Yeah. Or night, I guess. So. Yeah, Joey's not going to be sleeping ever again, so he's fine. Yeah, uh, he's up. He's gonna be up around the clock, so he can record whenever. Uh, yeah, I think that's how that works, right? That's how it works. Yeah, kids. yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, Dan, appreciate it, man. We'll talk soon. Sounds good.